friendship forged in music, a partnership in its fourth decade, a lifetime in pursuit of the perfect song, and a community built along the way. 14 studio albums and another one in the wings. The band is Sky Diggers. This is Employee of the Myth. Track one, Debris. And now, in conversation with Jane Gowan of the Music Buddy podcast, Andy Mays and Josh Finlayson. Sky Diggers. Well, hello, Sky Diggers. Hello, Andy Jane. Mays, Josh Finlayson. How lovely to see you. Good to see you, Jane. Nice to see you, too. And thank you for inviting me to do this interview with you. I'm really touched and delighted. So, congratulations on this album. This being your which number album is this? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> what did we figure studio-wise? It's like 13 or 14, 15, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Because you have other albums that are, you know, reissue albums and... Live albums. Live and, and things like that. So your catalog is significant and getting uh, better by the moment. So this album, Hide Your Light, Bide Your Time, you're releasing in three, three parts. parts. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about Hide Your Light today, which Excellent. is the first, the first digital EP. It's a stunner. It gets, the songs seem really fresh, but also timeless. When you were setting out to make the album, did you have a particular overall concept in mind, or what were your thoughts? I think the focus was uh, working with Joby Baker in Victoria at his studio. And Andy had made a record with Joby probably 10 years ago. And he, we know him through a couple of friends as well, from uh, uh, who he's worked with on projects with some friends of ours. And uh, it, it was just the three of us because COVID was still happening. So mm-hmm. uh, that became, I think, the, uh, that gave it a bit of a shape and a focus mm-hmm. in terms of what it was going to become. Mm-hmm. And he's quite the multi-instrumentalist, aside from having a studio and everything and having all the gear there, because he's, play, he's playing quite a lot on this record, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. 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 Drums, bass, keyboards. Amazing. He doesn't play the guitar until he picks it up, and then he plays the guitar as well. He, he, played the, he had a tenor guitar, which was like, he tuned like a bass, but he played like a guitar. It was, it was, that was a cool instrument to include. And... It, the way we recorded it was uh, Andy and I would play to a click track and just start with the basic track, and then we would build from there. He'd usually add drums or bass first mm-hmm. to it, and then we would just go in a direction and decide whether we liked that direction or whether we would change it. So, you know, we would sometimes start down a road and then decide, let's try something different, and that, would, that was easy to do in that context. His studio is on a property on Vancouver Island. Is that like a large property? So you were kind of sequestered there in the mm-hmm. countryside. Yeah, it's 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 about twenty minutes from downtown uh, Victoria, and they have the they live up on in this sort of hilly region. It's about ten acres of property. A beautiful like rainforest. It was stunningly mm-hmm. beautiful. Mm-hmm. We'd walk out into uh, you know into that in between takes. Or Not too he bad. also loved to. He loves to cook as well, and so he was very uh, uh, hospitable. And it was he loves to cook. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bonus. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you described it. I've heard you describe it previously when we were talking about it as a rock and roll fantasy camp. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was. It was. He was great. I mean, he definitely provided a focus for the for the the record, and it, you know, he's a terrific musician, mm-hmm. and. Um, and then we also had our uh, our friend Daniel Lapp uh, come in. He he's a trumpet player and a fiddle player, and he played some mandolin, I think, as well. Uh, and some banjo. Also, uh, yeah, um, a Bango. terrific musician. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we've known Daniel for probably almost twenty five years now, and uh, he was, you know, that was also a great great asset to have for the recording.
You start the album with a cover song, mm -hmm. Debris by Ronnie Lane. I was just so happy to hear you covering this song because I just think it's just such a earthy, soulful, working class ballad that speaks to so much of the same themes that you guys often sing about. Growing up, learning from the ones you love, caring for your elders, caring for your family. Did you choose that for those reasons or how did this song come to be the one that is the first one on Hide Your Light? Um, Ron Macy, who played uh, with the Sky Diggers for many years, was mm -hmm. a huge Ronnie Lane fan. And uh, I remember him telling me about or turning me on to a, a great documentary, a BBC documentary called The Passing Show. Yeah. And remember watching that. And, you know, I mean, he had an incredible life and kind of a, a tragic life, too. I mean, he, he became ill with MS, but, you know, just seemed to have good luck and bad luck in his in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, and this song in particular, I remember him talking about in the documentary. He uh, he wrote it about his dad, his dad, who I think would totally doted on Ronnie and mm -hmm. uh, post Second World War London mm -hmm. uh, debris. You know, obviously the city had been bombed. And I remember one story in particular that he told about that song and about his dad, his dad saying, you know, learn to play an instrument. You'll have a friend for life. And I think that's some of the best advice uh, you can give anyone that's uh, growing lovely. up. That's really lovely. Yeah, because there's that great line in the song about his dad coming up the stairs singing that love song, that old familiar love song, and he's mm -hmm. waiting on the stairs for his dad. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Most parents say, don't become a musician, kids. <laughs> It'll get you nowhere. Well, the beauty of the of the quote, too, is just that the instrument is, a, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a vocation. It just, it's a, it's an escape. It's a, it's a therapy. It's a, it's a friend, you know, mm -hmm. it's someone that you, you can, you know, it's like, it's like a, it's like having a, an animal or a pet growing up. That's, That's right. what I loved about that, that yeah. image in that story. Mm -hmm. Well, and you two are such long standing friends. I mean, the, this song came out in 1971. Would that would have been maybe fairly close to the time that the, two of you met that's true yeah probably that's true yeah also that sound of the 70s the sounds that records had back then mm -hmm. i don't know if there was something like that for you that's that spoke to you about that but i think we've always been in search of great songs mm -hmm. i mean that's that's always been a, a goal of ours mm -hmm. is to find great songs and if they resonate with us to perform them then that's just a bonus you know, a lot of people know this song, but not, and then there are a lot of people who don't know this song, but I think it just sort of, regardless, it'll be, a, it's a familiar sounding song, and it sort of speaks to our collective memory. Is memory something that's really important for you to write about? Because I find you, you do tend to delve into that subject quite a bit, and the importance of memory, and the the gift of memory, I guess, and also the feelings it brings. So was that something you were thinking about with this song? That's a good question. Um, there's always, I, I guess as one ages, one spends probably more time looking back than, mm -hmm. uh, than you realize. And, and I guess things resonate with you that uh, you're not always necessarily um, aware of why, they just do. Nostalgia is is something that I, I guess I fall prey to, mm -hmm. uh, far more frequently than I'd like to admit. But the song, you know, when Josh started playing it, and then we started working on it um, a couple of years ago, uh, it just felt right. I always think there's certain songs that Andy's voice really lends himself. Uh, his his voice transcends the song and his his voice and encap encapsulates the uh the meaning of it and the uh, intention of it and I, I felt like this was one sometimes we hit on on songs and you know sometimes he can really embody a song and uh, and kind of own it and i think this is a good example of that beyond our own material which is i think more easily access that way because he's he's written it and it's for his voice but then there's songs that 
he can really uh, just become, you know, and I think this is a good example of it. Without question, there's, there's nostalgia, but there's also a little bit of melancholy in it as well. Definitely. And I think that's a quality that Andy can really channel. <laughs> um, did you want to play a little bit of it yeah. now? Or? Sure. This is, this, is, this is the very first song that we recorded. Oh, is it? For, with, with Joby. So it was, this was kind of the, uh, this was the, hey, how you doing? Get to know you yeah. song. And I think it, it uh, as an icebreaker, it, it uh, worked That's pretty great. well and pretty quickly. I think we fell into a, a nice working rhythm uh, very quickly. Left you on the debris at the Sunday morning market. You were sorting through the odds and ends. You were looking for a bargain. I heard your footsteps at the front door. That old familiar love song Cause you knew you'd find me waiting there At the top of the stairs Cause I went there and back Just to see how far it is. And you, you tried to tell me But I had to learn for myself So I left you on the debris We both know you got no money And I wonder what she could have done Without me hanging around you That song, it just is such a everyman song. I don't know if that's the politically correct way to say that, but uh, it's a human song. It's a song that, you know, is humble and modest. You two are very much that way, and the, the album is called, you know, this half of the album is called Hide Your Light. <laughs> and um, it just speaks to not bragging about your accomplishments, to highlighting others. And you, you've always worked with other people, like in the early days, coming up you're working with uh, you, you had Pete Cash in your band you had Ron Macy and you were working with Andrew Cash mm -hmm. all the friends and musical compadres that you've mm -hmm. well certainly over the years certainly yeah. Andrew was a huge part of uh, of of the beginning of the of the band and yeah. and uh, you know I sang with Andrew for uh, for a couple of years mm. and sang on his first uh, record time and place mm -hmm. And Josh and I, uh, as when we started as a duo, we used to Andrew, Andrew, uh, Jim Ediger, and I were doing a weekly um, acoustic meltdown in uh, the beverage room at the Spadina Hotel, mm -hmm. and Josh and I would get up and play, I think, two songs, and uh, and also uh, Jason Collette and uh, Kirsty McLeod and Catherine Rose. Uh, would uh, who called themselves Lazy Grace? Right. They they would play a couple of songs as well, and and this went on. This was this went on for several months, mm. and it was uh, it was a great uh, the 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 phrase that's coming uh, to mind, which isn't very poetic, is training ground. Yeah, it was a, it was a great way to uh, 
just learn how to do what we do in front of an audience. I mean, mm -hmm. Josh and I had both been in bands, but you know, when you're playing as a duo, you're, you've kind of uh, you've stripped it down to its basic elements, and mm -hmm. you know right away whether a song's working or not because mm -hmm. there's nowhere to hide. You can't hide behind the bass or the drums or a, a guitar right. solo. Or yeah. so so it was a great uh, it was a great uh, training ground, and it was a great proving ground as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess having to come up with new material, you don't want to be playing the song, the same songs each week because it was a weekly thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we tried not to, although there were a yeah. couple that we, uh, I think that we played fairly, uh, fairly regularly. Where yeah, for we sure, we, yeah. we, you know, it was, I mean, it was a residency, it was a weekly residency, and which when Andrew uh, Cash went off to make his first solo record with Island Records, uh -huh. we ended up taking the evening over i think initially with, with lazy, lazy grace, grace yeah but right. then they they stopped doing it and it became we just took it over as a monday night early you know an early monday night it was over mm -hmm. by 10 o'clock so we would have to come up with some new material mm -hmm. every week uh some of which got incorporated into each week and some of which you know would come and go just depending on uh whether it was working or not for, you know, for the reasons that Andy suggested. And that's how we started. A P. Cash had been doing the door for Andrew, and yeah. that's where we met him. And he one night he handed Andy a tape of songs that he had written. And, uh, you know, much to Andy's surprise, I, I think much, much to Andrew, uh, his brother Andrew's surprise as well, he didn't know. That Speaking he, of hide yeah, your light. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, here's Pete, a Pete's a pretty private person, mm -hmm. if I may use that alliteration so early in the day. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'd known Pete because I'd been following L'Etranger since about 82. Right. I was a big, big fan. And Pete was always at the gigs. He and uh, Charlie's brother, Mike, uh, uh, Charlie Angus's brother, Mike, they were always around the stage. They yeah. were kind of security slash, <laughs> uh, I don't know, but... Uh, I didn't. I knew Pete. I had no idea he wrote songs. And when when I heard the tape, uh, it, I had no idea what to expect right. in advance. And yeah. then when I heard it, it was just it was kind of shocking because think. it it sounded exactly like Pete. It's it was exact. He was he was just himself. Who he was. He mm -hmm. was just who he was. And and it was like, oh, this this really fits in with what. Josh and I are doing. We were playing, you know, Hank Williams songs and Doc Watson versions of traditional songs, and yeah. and uh, and it just was. It was just kind of a perfect fit. Was, once again, that was Andrew who brought us together. Mm -hmm. Andrew gave us a na our That's name. Right. Yeah. He uh, he was looking for a name for his band, and uh -huh. one of the names that he decided not to use was Sky Diggers. Very nice. And, and Josh and I just kind of went, "Do you mind if we uh, use that?" We'll so pick up that table scrap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I mean, Pete wrote a lot of those songs in the early days, too, but Andrew also contributed, too. Like he wrote the song, You've Got a Lot of Nerve, which is probably one of your bigger hits, and uh, and others, I would assume, too. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lots he of also contributions. He and Pete wrote uh, What Do You See, which is also on road radio, and there are other... We did a version of uh, Wake Up Little Darlin', mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. which is from Andrew's record, High. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting... Uh, as our first album was coming out, we were doing a lot of playing with Andrew, uh, all of us together, mm. and we did a, a, a concert at um, at Trinity St. Paul United Church uh, in March of uh, 1990, just as our album came out, and it was sold out. It was a, a beautiful um, beautiful event and our record company couldn't figure out what we were doing because we just had our own record out and here we are combining with Andrew right. and it but it was it was terrific and there were we did talk around that time of 
being collaborating. Uh, being a band, all of us together. It it didn't end up happening, but right. uh, but we did a lot of playing together at that time. So Andrew went and did his solo career, and then Pete mm-hmm. eventually went and joined Andrew. Mm-hmm. Later, yeah, much later. Yeah, much later. Yeah. Okay. But that um, show at that show at Trinity Saint Paul was, yeah. it is, uh, it is one of our most memorable shows ever. Wow! Is there footage of that somewhere? It was recorded. It was I right. think CBC recorded, recorded, CBC it, recorded but, it, but uh, hmm. but I don't think they had any microphones in the anyway. But I remember we started that show with Andrew's uh, song "Morning Train," wow. and we started with an a cappella section, and. Being in the church, the acoustics, and then Pete singing way down, the whole place just vibrated. Oh, amazing. It was, and then the show was, we were off and running. It was one of those moments that uh, you spend all of your time trying to get back there mm-hmm. in live shows. You know, you have those live shows where you, you they're, they're so terrific. Uh, they set the bar so high that you spend all of your time trying to get back to that feeling, that feeling of... Wow. For me, I mean, I, it, it's a memorable show without question because it was also early on. It was a, you know, it was a big room. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, and I know uh, Andrew and Pete's dad was at that show. Uh, and I don't think he had seen them very often. Mm. Wow. Um, I remember that. I know our Andy and I, our folks were there too. So it, it, yeah, it had this, there was a lot of things about it that were memorable in my mind and musically that I guess really that community of being with Andrew and knowing him and knowing the songs and um, and he you know he had a pretty extensive catalog to to uh, delve into as well at that point so mm-hmm. it, it was an extension of who we were and uh, and Andrew was very much a part of that you know as a songwriter he really he he kind of in my mind kind of set the bar a little mm-hmm. bit for mm-hmm. where we were right what being a songwriter and uh, uh, of course with many other examples and people but he mm-hmm. worked really hard at it and and you know when a- Andy said about Pete uh, you know hearing hearing the songs that he wrote and he had no idea what to expect when when you hear them it's it, it made perfect sense because it was just an extension of who he was. Mm-hmm. And that that was sort of one of his, and is one of his most uh, endearing qualities is that he is always himself in any situation. Mm. He's, uh, and that also gave us a certain, I think, authenticity and, uh, and, and a, it grounded us, I think, as a band and yeah. gave us a bit of an identity, helped provide that. Yeah. And do you feel you've managed to be yourselves all these years and you've managed Most of the just, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think as well, you have, you know, uh, from that you have to grow and evolve. And when, certainly when Pete left the band, that was the, you know, we couldn't rely on that part of it, but we had to learn uh, take what we learn from all that and, and move forward as you do. And with any creative endeavor, you have to keep moving ahead. Well, as a segue, do you, do you have an Andrew Cash song, that little bit of one that you'd maybe absolutely humor us with? That would be great. Jenny rides to the hurting side of town She got up once then she got let down Well I spit up and then they lie back down She sits up and you come to her in lips, your face is dry, but your fingers drip. Yeah, got a lot of nerve coming around here.
just a taste. The album is called Hide Your Light. The band is Sky Diggers, and this has been Employee of the Myth. The podcast is engineered by Tim Vesley and mixed by Jane Gowan. If you enjoyed this conversation, please rate, review, share, subscribe, and play it loud. My name is Joel Stewart. Thanks for listening. Don't look to me for the answer. I don't know nothing anymore. I'll do my best in the meantime and wonder what it's been for. Je t'aime toujours, mon amour. Je t'aime toujours, mon amour.